Um, how to create contrast in your wushu form. Um, yes, this is a keynote. That's how nerdy I was. I actually made a keynote for this presentation. Um, uh, but before we get started, remember that this is a fundraiser. Uh, we are suggesting that there's a donation to Doctors Without Borders. You can go to www.doctorswithoutborders.org. And also huge shout out to Jun Hong Chong, good friend of mine. Uh, we've competed together, we've judged together, we've traveled to different countries and states together. Um, if you're not already, and I'm sure you are, make sure you follow him on Instagram at uh, Jun Hong's Kung Fu Club. Um, uh, one, more, one more thing. <laughs> I have got a Tai Chi and Tai Chi Sword course starting tomorrow that's online live on Zoom. Uh, if you use the code Wushu Day Live, you'll get a 20% discount. And you can go to wushuathome.teachable.com. Okay, my plugs are over. We're going to get into it here. How to create contrast in your Wushu form. Uh, and this is not just for contemporary Wushu. Um, this can also be for traditional Wushu. Okay, so what is contrast? Contrast is the difference or a noticeable difference between two or more things that are in close association, right? So in Wushu Taolu, this can be between uh, different moves in a single combination. It can be between combinations or different sections of your form. Um, it can also be within a single movement. And I know that sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but it, because I just said, uh, it's a noticeable difference between two or more things. How can, it, uh, how can you show contrast in one movement? We're gonna show some examples of that later. Okay, it's based on not only what movements are performed, but also how those movements are performed, mostly on how the movements are performed. Okay, there are a lot of different kinds of contrast. This is just some stuff that I wrote down that came to my head. I'm sure there are a lot of other kinds of contrast. Uh, tension, this is the difference between being relaxed and tense. So there might be times in your form where you really tense up many muscles in your body, you're standing very erect, and there are times where you'd want to relax uh, your body uh, using more finesse and show that difference between tension, right? I like to, uh, when I'm teaching people, I, I tell people tension is kind of a scale from zero to 10, 10 being like steel and zero being like jelly. And depending on what movement you're doing or where you are in a form, you wanna be somewhere on that scale and you want to move up and down that scale. And if you move quickly or jump between different parts of that scale, you can create contrast. Another is direction. This is pretty easy. Left and right, going forward and backward. Uh, also cutting diagonal and, and running in an arc. And a lot of times in forms, we think about like only running forward, like face in a direction and go that way, right? Then turn and go in another direction. But also think about sidestepping, think about retreating, and think about changing your direction uh, within a, a specific section. Um, altitude. Altitude is, is high and low, right? Changing your height, maybe before you do a T-Shi, go low before that. Or conversely, before you're going to go low, maybe into a drop stance or into an empty stance, briefly go high or extend up and then go down. Uh, speed, oh, oh, sorry, size. Size is... Uh, I use the words compression and expansion. You could think of this as being small and big. Uh, there's a really great example I'm gonna share later, but this is just uh, changing how your body is perceived, right? If, if we we're thinking about Wushu as being a performance, how are you perceived while you're, while you're doing your form, right? Compression being small and extension being big. Speed, going slow and fast. Uh, timing, so this is, these are things like rhythm and tempo and syncopation and how you can change or how you can control your timing to create contrast in your form. Another one is patterns. This is a little bit hard to explain, but I've got a video example later. This is between uh, expectation and surprise. So let's say this is more um, uh, related to contemporary Wushu where you're doing your own choreography. But in Wushu, we're kind of used to seeing certain patterns, certain movements are done uh, regularly in a sequence, right? Hammer fist to slap fist, slap fist to wheeling arm, wheeling arm to slap in the ground, right? Wulam Panda. If you're aware of those patterns, if you break those patterns, you can create surprise. Uh, I'm sure you've all had instances where you're watching a, a video of someone doing Wushu and they do something unexpected and you go, whoa, like what was that, right? Really catches your attention. 
Okay, we've talked about what is contrast. Well, why? Why is contrast important, right? If we're just doing martial arts, why a, a punch is a punch, a kick is a kick. Um, so why should we even be talking about it? Contrast is a way for a wushu athlete to exhibit body control and coordination. So it's a way for you to show your skill, right? I, I, I don't, I can't, uh, not only can I do this movement this way, but I can also do it this way, right? Showing different ways of movement and that you are able to control precisely which way you will move. Uh, it shows your ability to execute and link movements together, right? So you're not just starting and stopping. You're not just out on the floor moving like a robot. Although I would say, when we talk about robots, I think of robots from like the 80s because that's when I was a kid. But now robots are amazing and then many robots can move better than humans. Maybe that term like move like a robot, that, that might change uh, with this next generation. Um, uh, it allows you to express your own individual style, right? We're not all carbon copies of each other. We're not carbon copies of our Sifu, right? We are our own individuals as we go through our, our journey of wushu practicing. Uh, it also demonstrates your understanding of wushu, not just of the techniques themselves, but also about the performance element of wushu. If you're a competitor, uh, you are performing in front of judges, in front of an audience, and we should not um, overlook that. Okay, and most importantly, most importantly, when we're talking about things like contrast and shenfa and feeling and spirit, Right, contrast adds a layer on top of, but it does not replace strong wushu basics, correct execution of wushu techniques, and also your, your own physical abilities, right? Um, you've all heard the saying, you can't polish a turd, right? You, you have to be good at wushu in order to polish it. And I think contrast is a way to polish your wushu, okay? So much talking. Um, Let's get into some wushu videos. Okay, so as we watch, well, I've got a several videos. We're gonna just show real short clips. Uh, each clip will be shown at full speed and then will be shown at half speed. I'm just gonna let those loop and um, I'm gonna talk through it. And if anybody else wanna ask questions of you, um, please chime in with, with your own thoughts. Okay, so th this is a video from the World Kung Fu Championships. Uh, man, just, bringing this clip up, brings back some good memories. Remember when we could actually go to wushu competitions and, and, and be close to other people and be in a big room with a big, with a big crowd? And this was in China, so there were a lot of big crowds on that trip. Um, okay, so when we're looking at this, what are we seeing in terms of contrast? We're definitely seeing changes in tempo and rhythm, right? Changes in speed. She's pausing in certain places. She's going high, low, and she's slowing down. Then watch these steps. She's creating a beat, one, two, then she changes the beat. She pauses and makes that third step big, right? So it's a changing in rhythm. Also a change of direction. When she comes out of here, she's jumping and turning, looking right then looking left. All of those added together, I feel like are creating a lot of contrast in just this very short section. This is just right after her opening of the form, right? Obviously, she's a great athlete. She's from Hong Kong, and I believe she was a former China athlete. I could be wrong about that. Uh, so she has a high level of skill, but because of the way she's choreographed this, because of the way she's performing it, it just looks so dynamic. She's creating lots and lots of contrast here. Um, switch it up a little bit. This is Chachren, right? Traditional style uh, done by who I believe is a contemporary athlete. So there's, there's that to consider. Um, so what are we seeing here? Very short combination, very classic cha-cha and movements. High to low, right? Before she goes big, she's going small. She compresses herself, her shoulders and her chest come forward. She looks down, then she extends and goes up. She's also relaxing her hands and arms so that she has a, a flicking motion at the end, classic chachan, and then sticking it. Big, small compression expansion, high, low, and also tension, relaxing and then tensing. Next video, one of the greatest of all times, Lu Haibo. 
This is, uh, this is an old video. This is from 1997. Okay, so I've been doing enough talking. What do you, what do you see? Right, we had altitude, we had size, we had compression, we had tension, we had direction. What are you seeing here as far as how he's creating contrast and making this dynamic? You can go ahead and chime in if you want to unmute yourselves. It feels like when he's going in any extreme, he's doing it in such a big way that when he shifts, it's like a big shift. Huge. I mean, look, Lou Haibo is a very small man. <laughs> he, he's, he's just a short guy, but his arms and limbs aren't, aren't long, but he makes his wushu look huge. So I agree with you. When he extends, he really commits. He's opening up his chest, really reaching out, but he's also creating contrast because before he does that, he goes small. So by going small before he goes big, it makes it look even bigger, right? You're comparing those two things side by side. If he was just extended the entire time, his wushu would still look good, but it's, it's creating more contrast because he's able to also go small. Anything else you guys are seeing here? High, low, altitude changes. He's doing moves that he doesn't really need to go low on, but he goes very low and then springs out of it very, very quickly. We have some uh, comments in the comment oh, section. I wasn't even looking here. Okay. Oh, okay. Dusty, planes of movement. Yeah. Many movements along vertical, horizontal, and diagonal. Absolutely. Right. So directions aren't just about stepping, it's moving forward, moving backward, stepping right, stepping left. It can also be directions, as, as Dusty said, planes of movement. He's cutting on a vertical plane, then moving on the horizontal plane, then turning on the horizontal plane, and then stabbing. Uh, in another direction. Uh, Ethan Lee says his eyes follow all his movements. Yeah, head snaps. Head snaps are also uh, a, a way to create contrast. There's a moment here where he kind of does this little fake out move there. It's like he's out and he's like, looks to his left, he's like, nope, and he goes the other direction. So that does a few things, right? It changes the tempo. He's kind of like, ba, 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 ba. With that adding that extra little beat, it's like, ba, 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 right? If, I like to make sound effects when I'm thinking about wushu. Um, I know other wushu people do it too, so I'm, I'm not the cra only crazy one here. But yeah, agree with all those things. I think there was one more uh, comment. Yeah, leg stance dynamically change and adapt to his upper body. Yeah, upper and lower body coordination, right? Showing this contrast, he is showing everybody, the audience in the room, the judges, and then all of us 20 years later, how much control he has over his body. Um, this is another video from the same competition. This is uh, Liu Qinghua. And I'm only showing her opening because I think there's a lot of very subtle things going on here. Um, we can watch the whole thing in slow motion and at full speed. And this video will keep looping just like Liu Habo's. I would say this first move is an example of, uh, remember at the beginning I said, you can even create contrast within one single move. So that opening, all she's doing is like raising her right arm out with a sword finger, right? But look at how she does it. She starts it fast, then goes slow, and she's fully extended. And then at the very end, before she moves out of it, she like relaxes slightly. You can see the arm bent, watch it here. It's a very, very subtle move, right? But she's showing, I am extended, I am tense, and then I'm relaxing, I'm slightly, and then it's almost like giving you a hint like, oh, something's gonna happen next, and then she goes to the next move, right? So contrast can even be very, very subtle. Contrast doesn't have to be, you know, 100 versus 10. It can also be like, oh, I'm at 10, and I'm gonna slowly move out into 20, and then boom, 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 boom. Obviously, then she has changes in speed, super fast slap kick and then an altitude change staying real high you're not sure where she's going to go and then goes into the lowest possible drop stance on the face of the earth in the history of wushu <laughs> queen queen of the poo boo uh anything else dusty is saying uh angles and degrees ankle knees hips waist shoulders fluid but dynamic yeah yeah all good comments i just think this is such a good example like it's just the opening she hasn't even really done any wushu yet, except for the slap kick. But just here, she's already showing you, like, watch me. 
Like something big is going to happen now. Okay. I'm going to go back to the World Kung Fu Championships. Um, so this is, this is a, a traditional form. So this is like Wudang Jian, but it's kind of like a modern Wudang Jian. If you know the history of this form and, and the style, we could talk another hour about that. I'm going to stay away from that. But uh, that she is a, a modern Wushu athlete from Russia. So part of it is, is the choreography, right? Like before I said, uh, um, some of the things we're talking about as far as your ability to control contrast would be like your choreography. Okay, if you're doing a standardized form, you can't change the choreography, but you can control how you're performing the movements. So obviously some speed changes, but like very dynamic speed changes. And then also softness. It's like fast, 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 full extended, and then this one, slow, right? So she's not going up and going, boom, right? Sword finger or palm strike, boom. She's coming up and kind of slowly and gently going up into that tishi, which shows control. And then she snaps out of it, fast kick, changes direction back, fast, 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 and then stop, right? Showing high level of control and the ability to switch between those modalities of moving, being soft and relaxed and, and you know, going fast and being really rigid. Okay, this next video is a cool one. Uh, this is from Gai Shan Wushu from uh, Brazil. They just posted this video like this week and I, I, it caught my eye and I thought it was really cool. Um, we're, again, we're gonna watch this several times. I thought this was a good example of some things that, um, uh, aren't so obvious. So again, if you wanna, you wanna jump in the chat and say, how do you think she's creating contrast? Or if you wanna uh, unmute yourself and share anything. Good control of high and low, right? That beginning before that first kick, she's compressing herself, going very, very low into a low squat. Um, what I think is interesting is how the choreography keeps you almost guessing. So uh, I remember when, when I first watched this video, there were like four or five times in this little short combination where I thought, oh, she's going to slap the ground next. Oh, no, she's not going to slap the ground. Oh, she's doing that uh, combination. I know it's next. Oh, no, oh, no, she didn't do it. And, uh, okay, now here, she's going to slap the ground. Nope. And then finally, it's like, uh-huh, I know it's coming up now. Going to slap the ground? No. So, right, so if you're aware of the patterns in Wushu, oh, when I do a front slap kick and start doing a wheeling arm, right, your brain is already anticipating, yes, she's going to slap the ground. But because she doesn't, right, that's creating contrast because it's breaking a pattern. It's unexpected. It's surprising. And she does it several times just in this, this one section. Yeah, Ethan, exactly, yeah. A lot of wheeling arms, but in different directions, slightly different rhythms. Yeah, it seems unpredictable. That's a great word to use. I think when, when you see a Wushu athlete and you just can't take their eyes off them because you're like, what's coming up next? Like, what is going on? Um, based on choreography, right? Understanding how patterns work breaking a pattern, right? Creating a pattern, breaking a pattern. Okay, moving on. So we've talked about what contrast is, all the different ways or, or different types of contrast. We showed some videos and, and you've kind of been able to look at it clearly with an analytical eye. Um, how do you develop contrast? It, okay, so it takes a lot of work, right? This isn't just gonna happen by you uh, showing up at practice, right? It takes dedication. It takes dedication and you've got to experiment. You've got to try a lot of things. Um, and this will depend on kind of your experience level of Wushu and also your physical abilities. Let's say you've been doing Wushu for three years, right? You have certain abilities. You have a certain skill level. Um, when you experiment and try things, don't try to be Lu Qinghua. Don't try to be Sun Peian, you know, Choose things that are appropriate for your skill level. If, if you've been doing Wushu for 10 years and um, you know, you've made your national team or you've ranked very highly, 
at uh, your team trials, hey, shoot for the moon, go for it, okay? Just know that the process is, is iterative. So you, you've got to try something for a little while. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. So then you, you, you try something else. You kind of keep changing it. Don't just think, I'm, I'm going to do the opening just like Lu Qinghua. And you'll do this move or this combination for three years and like you're not quite getting it, okay? You have to be honest with yourself, uh, honest with your progression, and then, you know, um, change your training depending on how things are working out for you. Uh, you it's going to take a lot of refinement. Also, don't try a million things at once. Uh, again, kind of related to your skill and experience level, but I would recommend like start with one thing or start with just a few things. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big combination. It can be just like, well, how do I do this one head snap before this movement and, and bring out more contrast in my performance, right? Start small, start small. Okay, also use the tools that are available to you. Try different methods, both during and outside of practice. Uh, you, if you're really, really serious about Ushu, right? Your practice doesn't end when you leave your Wushu school. All the big Wushu nerds, I think, will agree, like, you've got to just be, like, living and breathing it. you got to, like, watch videos. you got to be thinking about it. you got to be, you know, standing and waiting for the bus, and in your head, you're like, front slap kick, you know, drop stance, like, okay, head snaps. Don't look like a crazy person on the street, but, you know, as Brian Wang famously said in one of my interviews, to be good at Wushu, you've got to be a little crazy. And I was like, damn straight, Brian. Okay. Um, uh, talking about tools and methods outside of Wushu practice, one, watch videos of other people. And when I say watch other people, don't just look at the current top Chinese athletes. Okay. Yes, they're very, very good. It's good to aspire to be there. But remember, they are professional athletes. We are amateurs, right? They've been doing Wushu since they were six years old. I started Wushu when I was 18. Uh, the, got a lot of catching up to do. Um, it just means that our abilities are different and that we have different resources. Look at athletes from other countries and, and men and women, and also look at different ages and different skill levels. That was really cool at the uh, World Kung Fu Championships that we we're just watching. You got to see, oh, Cha Chen by a female from um, Russia. Oh, Cha Chen by uh, a man from Brazil. Look at how they all uh, perform, how they show their individual style, and then you can start gleaming like, what do you like? You have to build up your taste. Um, this is like, uh, you know, when you have that friend and, you, and you're like, let's go to sushi. And they're like, I've never had sushi. And you get there and they're like, this Godzilla roll is amazing with the spicy mayo. And oh my God, the bright green topico on the top. And you're like, yeah, that's cool. It's not like really great sushi, but it's cool that you like it. And that's like their entryway. Similar, similar in Wushu is like when you first start out, you're just like, oh, I love everything. Oh my God, that person is jumping. They're so fast. I love it. <coughs> and then they're like watching tricking videos like this is amazing. They do the butterfly twist. And you're like, okay, you have to develop your taste. And that comes with time. And you just need to be exposed to it over and over and over. Going to competition is a good way to do that, but also watching videos. Video access to videos is so amazing right now. Before we had to like trade VHS tapes and you would get like one or two tapes a year and that was it. Amazing now. YouTube, Zoom, geez, free uh, Wushu training sessions from Wushu Day Live today. Amazing. Okay, record videos of yourself and really analyze those videos. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this for a little bit. Uh, okay. You have to watch videos of yourself with a real analytical eye. And I know this is tough. Um, I know it's really hard to, to watch yourself doing wushu and, and be critical of yourself because you're seeing like, oh, like, oh, my back was bent. Like, ah, I saw it in slow motion. And oh my God, I can't believe my foot was off the ground or I look like that. Um, it's hard to do, but is uh, really, really important. And when we're talking about recording videos, um, don't just post it on Instagram and then like wait for the likes to come in, right? I, look, I put wushu videos of myself on Instagram. All my other friends here, Jun Hong, Matthew, everybody, we all put videos up, but don't like put it up and not analyze. Matt's like, no, I don't put videos up. I put videos of other people up. Don't just like bask in the glory of the Instagram likes, right? 
this is one instagram is just a like factory right oh you follow me i like your stuff you, i follow you i like your stuff it's a good pat on the back it may keep you inspired but remember most of those people that are liking your videos um they're not wushu instructors they're not certified wushu judges so if you're really serious about improving your wushu who are you trying to impress like the random you know shaolin x o zero one underscore cool guy on instagram or do you want um somebody who's like a really skilled uh wushu person be like hey that was pretty good but hey try this other thing right don't do it just for the gram don't do it just for the gram um find inspiration outside of wushu listen to a lot of different kinds of music don't just listen to pop music listen to a lot of different kinds of music classical music electronic music anything with with broken beats uh movie scores anything where the music will take you on a journey uh listen to that music when you're watching wushu videos maybe turn the audio off and, and turn the music on listen to that music in your car or in your headphones on your way to wushu practice and like imagine like that's the soundtrack to your wushu and if that was the soundtrack to to your wushu what would it feel like if you could make your wushu have that uh tempo that change rising falling and how could you express that feeling to to the judges to your coach to the audience at the wushu competition Okay, I was going to share some videos, but because of the way I have my audio set up, I can't do it. Um, that's okay. Uh, we are going to keep going. Okay, so we've talked about what contrast is. We've talked about all the different kinds. We watched some videos. Talked about some uh, different ways of dressing it. But uh, methods for developing contrast. Uh, this is the first way, which is like reverse engineering yourself reverse engineering your wushu okay uh so first is be like looking for inspiration seeing other wushu athletes you i suggest you watch videos and say oh i like the way that so and so does that move like oh my god that combination is so sick okay for a lot of wushu athletes the methodology stops there and like i'm just going to copy them watch the video a few times okay and i'm going to try to do it and you're like trying to move like sun Yun or trying to I'm going to try to buy Lu Haibo, but um, copying right, something does not mean that you actually understand it. Or you don't know how that athlete got to that place to be able to do their wushu like that. So this is just a short list. We're going to talk through this. So you've decided on what kind of contrast you want to work on or how to do this combination. Okay, for Identify the skills that are necessary in order to express that contrast. Right. So Lu Haibo small man extension okay to make that big and small i've got to work on my flexibility opening up my chest so maybe it's not even doing wushu you're just at home doing exercises like this maybe it's getting some elastic bands attaching it to the wall and working not just on your flexibility and mobility but like what feeling what muscles are connected do i need to extend and to pull right and not like don't just do that wushu movement work on drills that can help you build that skill okay uh, so yeah identify how to build those skills and then go back so you've kind of like reverse engineered this is thing i want to do okay what are the steps and the skills necessary to do it like that then once you've identified it then you like go back up the ladder right okay so the um kind of drawback i'm not saying it's a drawback but this might mean that you're going to be having to develop your weaknesses, right? It's, it's a skill. If you like, this is the contrast I want. And you're like, okay, what do I need to do? Oh, well, I don't have that skill. So you need to build that skill. So you're, you may have to develop your weakness, building skills that you currently lack. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of, right? So here's another way to do this. And I, I don't think a lot of Wushu athletes intentionally take this route. So this is start with your abilities, right? Rather than like looking at, I want to do that, start with your abilities and your attributes. So it's first identify how your attributes positively affect your abilities. And this can be, okay, I'm a tall, skinny person. I have, I have long limbs, okay? Uh, it can be, hey, I, I was a soccer player before. I, I played football, so I have good footwork. I can change direction quickly. I can pivot. Uh, I was an ice skater. That means I can rotate on a ver you know, with a vertical axis really well. 
um, or I was in theater. So I know how to project myself on a stage, right? Or you're a musician, so you understand rhythm and tempo, okay? So then you can figure out, well, what skills can be positively affected by those attributes or abilities that you already have, right? Then you figure out, then you figure out how to apply those skills to express the contrast, da 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 So the cool thing about taking this route is it allows you to leverage your strengths, allows you to leverage things you already have right now or that you are good at building right now, right? So the, the one before, reverse engineering stuff, like I'm gonna copy that person, okay, then I'm having to start from where I am and that's a skill I lack, so I'm developing a weakness, but this method allows you to leverage your strengths. I think some Wushu athletes will figure this out just by doing, it's like, oh, I, I was a gymnast, so okay, yeah, I'm good at this jump or I'm good at uh, keeping my posture up. Or, oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm a drummer, so I understand rhythm. So when I see my Sifu do that move and his foot works really cool, I just get it. Yeah, 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 forward, backward, half step, right, okay? Okay, so um, I'm gonna open this up. This was a short presentation. That's, that's the end of the formal presentation, but I'd like this to just go into a discussion of what you all think. We can ask questions, we can, we can share thoughts and ideas, but um, yeah, if you'd like to jump in, you can unmute your mic. You can talk about any challenges you've had in your training or, or, or whatever you want. What, what's, what's on your minds, everyone? Uh, Matthew Lee, come on. Mo Momo, come on, jump in here. You guys like talking, come on. Uh, I'd love so, to hear, oh, never mind, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I guess um, in competition, amongst the different contrasts that you mentioned in the beginning, what tends to be the contrast yeah. that you don't get to see as often that you wish that you really saw saw more of in comparison to the other types of contrast? I mean, one I, I would say is that uh, video from Gai Shan Wushu was pretty cool of like, make it unexpected, right? Um, we've all had this experience where you're watching someone's Wushu form and you almost like, you know what's coming next, you're like, uh-huh, hammer fist, slap fist, slap the ground, okay, then they're gonna go over there, they're gonna oh, jump front kick, aerial, yeah, jump inside split, I've seen it all before, and you're just like, yep, I know exactly what's coming. It's very refreshing not just as an audience member and as a Wushu enthusiast, but also as a judge, when somebody can show some choreography that's different, that's surprising, but also maybe they do it in a surprising way. Oh, I've, I'm used to seeing this combination done this way, but ooh, wow, they, you know, they looked right, they left, they changed the tempo a little bit. Um, I, I think that's always um, refreshing, but I think even more importantly than that, um, when somebody come, goes out there and shows their individual style, you know, it's like, oh, I've seen this, this combination done the same way because they're just, they're copying. I know exactly which athlete. I know exactly which Instagram or YouTube video that they're copying here. I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, I know. They are not Sun Peiyun, but they're trying to be Sun Peiyun. Okay. Uh, so it's when somebody like can do it their own way. But that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of time. That takes a high level of skill. I, I didn't really go through this before, but there are different types of contrast that may just work better for different skill levels, but also different body types. Some people have a lot of fast twitch muscles. Some people don't. So if you're somebody who doesn't have a lot of fast twitch muscles, um, fast, quick movements maybe aren't your thing. And if you're chasing that goal, you may get frustrated because you're never gonna get there, right? So depending on your body type, depending on your skill of Wushu, can also determine what types of contrast you should be pursuing right now. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah. Other thoughts, questions, experiences? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I had one question about uh, more rhythm and tempo, kind of how to set it up in, mm -hmm. like you were saying, developing your own way of doing a form. So yeah. for one thing, um, me and Jun Hong, I, I practiced Shaolin, and last year he was helping me with, um, I think he calls it a different name, but we just call it Shaolin Chuan. Um, mm -hmm. And he, the way he does it is the same movements, but very, it looks very different than the way I learned it. I noticed mm -hmm. he does things a little bit different, but one of the things that I'm trying to work on with uh, developing forms is when to put those pauses, when to put those, um, like that fajin and all that rhythm and tempo, just kind of, I noticed it's kind of harder, it's a lot harder than you would think, just picking those yeah. points. It's not easy. It's not easy. None of this is easy. I mean, one, Wushu, Kung Fu, martial arts is 
physically difficult, but also to work on these other kind of like esoteric things, shen fa and feeling and, you know, contrast. That's also very, very hard. So the, these are, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this session. I'm not going to be like, you watched my session. Now go do it. <laughs> no, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take time. Again, it goes back to like experimentation, trying different things, mm -hmm. you know, looking over at the mirror when you're doing a move, recording yourself. I think video is one of the most underutilized methods of really analyzing uh, how you move. Oh, um, for sure. I think it's, it's just such a, a useful tool. I know some people shy away from it. I take video of myself and I start watching. I'm like, oh my God, like Jesus. Yep. <laughs> and like, and then it, like, mm -hmm, just delete that file off my camera and that's, no one's gonna see that. Um, but you know, as you said, uh, you may have learned a combination or a form or, or a basic technique one way because you trained with one Sifu and then you go to another school or train with another Sifu and they've done it a different way. You know, we should never, we should not accept simply being a carbon copy of our teacher. Of course, mm -hmm. we want to respect our teacher. We want to follow their instruction. We want to listen to them. We don't ever want to uh, show up in class and, and have that ego We're like, yeah, I already know how to do this move, Sifu. I already, I already know. No, you have to be humble. But mm -hmm. um, you also should be developing, well, who are you as a martial artist? How, who are you a, a, as, a, as a Wush competitor? That will change as you maybe move from city to city and train with different teachers that will also change as you see other people doing that same form like oh this is xiao hongshen oh, interesting how they come how they collapsed in and then they're springier here right that does mm -hmm. that's something that's going to influence you as a person so um it's it's a never-ending journey it's always something you'll be developing um and refining uh, you know, I've been doing wushu for 25 something years now, and I'm still like, ooh, I, what's that? And you're like, okay, tr I'll try it that way. And you're like, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jiyun Hong's like, force yourself to watch yourself. Whew, it's hard. Uh, any, any other thoughts, comments? Yeah, uh, yeah mm -hmm. hi, Brandon. Um, so uh, I had a question regarding uh, opening and closing. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, to, to preface this, uh, you and I both know Master Narcissus. We've attended his seminars for uh, yeah. Shen and Dian Gan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's from uh, the traditional Wushu system of Ma style Hongbei, and they have a lot of open and close. Um, mm -hmm. So my question is, kind of going back to your slide earlier in your presentation, where contrast should add to but not take the place of good Wushu. I know that mm -hmm. sometimes a lot of this opening and closing involves uh, stretching out the spine and then mm -hmm rounding out the back, almost like the opposite of what we would consider conventional good posture. So this is something that I've experimented with. Um, and I thought yeah. that was very good talking about that opening and closing. I know we talked about this in your first um, We Should Do At Home class uh, when the, when the mm -hmm. pandemic first hit. Um, yeah, and man. We also talked about how that sometimes can conflict with previous instructions. Like, for example, the old school Beijing style, they, they always stressed having that chest open, shoulder blade traps squeezed, and, and you're, you're always yeah. having this like, body posture. But sometimes that might conflict with the open and close. So, for example, if I do something like a, like a zachim or like a hammer fist, right? I'm all the way up. My shoulders are rolled back like a big open. And then when I slam down, right, my shoulders are rounded forward. My, my back is completely rolled out, almost like, like I'm hunching, like, like bad posture. Mm -hmm. So my question is, mm -hmm. do you feel that uh, it might sometimes conflict with uh, the model of what technically correct or good posture is? And how do you reconcile that? Mm -hmm. Man, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to re reconcile it here in my answer. Um, you know, it's going to be depending on, on your athlete, on, on, the, on, the, on the teacher. It's also going to depend on like, well, what are your goals for Wushu, right? If your goal is to be a good competitor to make the national team, then you should be analyzing your Wushu through that lens, right? Who are the judges? What are, what's the rule book? What, what are, you know, what, what does it say there? What, how would you get deducted? So in that way, if you look at it through the eyes of the judges or, or how you're going to be scored, that will kind of like lead your training. Maybe not necessarily in this because it's kind of small, but I mean, we all know if, if you're a contemporary Wushu athlete and you've, and you've competed according to international rules that the B judging is really this like, what, how do they do it? I don't know, right? 
it's like, okay, I guess if I just go fast and I'm strong, I should be okay. But I think there's also this element um, that the rules are kind of pushing athletes to play it a little safe, right? Like, I don't think anybody's going to do a form like Lou Highball now um, because it's too risky. Also, he's expending so much energy, big, small, high, low, but he's not, he, by today's standards, he wouldn't get that much uh, benefit, right? And anything in Wushu, their competitive Wushu, risk and, and, and benefit, right? So if the benefit is getting a higher score, that's like non do not getting it. And then risk is like, well, if I go big, maybe I'll bobble or I'll take another step. Well, that's a point one deduction. So in that case, it's like, don't do it. It's not worth it. So going back to what I was saying, decide why you're doing Wushu. Seafood Narcissus Lateki, he's not competing what? anymore. He, he's just doing Wushu for fun. He even said like, yeah, I like doing like this. And then I change it up. And then I think about this other master. I'm like, I'm going to do it like this for a while. And now I like it that way. Right. All these different things like, no, oh, it's all the same system, but he's doing it different ways just because he likes it. So right. if you're doing Wushu or Kung Fu or whatever, because you like it, well, then you don't care about a score or someone saying, that's not the way you do that move. Well, you're experimenting, right? Um, mastery of Wushu is not this like end goal where you're like, oh, I'm there, cool, did it. Yeah, I'm an expert, I'm a master. No, it's always changing, right? So maybe what today you think is the right way may change in five years, depending on what your experience is. Um, sorry. Matt, I just went around in a big, big, big circle on that, on that response. Yeah, no, and I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, no, you know, no. It, it, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, it's very much about give and take and risk and knowing uh, what you want to yeah, do. Yeah, give and take. And what, yeah, what your goal is. Why, why are you doing Wushu? Why are you doing Wushu? And um, also, you know, be able to perform it both ways. So that when it's like, oh, I'm competing, I do it this way. And then when I'm at home, now I do it my own way. Um, Ethan Lee has a question here. He says, the question regards to practicing and energy usage. Yeah. Notice that for me personally, when I perform a wushu form, I use a lot of energy. I'm quite tired by the end. I was wondering what I should do to better build up my stamina, perhaps simply practicing more wushu and also making my movements more efficient. Um, I, think, I think it's twofold, Ethan. I think you've actually kind of answered your own question. As you get better at, at wushu, hopefully you'll become more efficient, right? Okay. You remember that first class where you're like, I have to keep my arms like this when I'm doing stretch kicks. And at the end, you're like, oh my God, my shoulders are so sore. And then, you know, after a year or two, it's like, oh yeah, I can do a line of kicks back and forth, no problem. One is efficiency and that will carry over to also like, well, how do you do a form? Where do I breathe? Where do I take pauses? You know, doing it this way, yeah, it looks cooler, but man, it's just harder. And going back to what Matthew said, it's not worth it. I'm not gonna get that benefit. So I'll pull back or maybe I'll take that move out or I'll do it in a way that's more efficient. On the flip side, yeah, building up stamina is a tough thing. And I would argue that simply doing more Wushu isn't a great way of building up stamina. I think everybody should be doing, if you're worried about stamina and also strength training too, you need to be doing stuff outside of Wushu. It's like jumping rope, sprinting, like get on a track, Right, right, that oval track, sprint the straightaway as fast as you can, walk the curve, sprint the straightaway, walk the curve, and keep doing that. You're out on that floor for a minimum of a minute and 20 seconds. You've got to build up your stamina where you're like, a minute and 20, no problem. Right? And I think just doing more wushu probably isn't the best way of doing that. So. One, learning to move more efficiently. Two, choose, picking and choosing how you do moves, what moves you do. And three, uh, exercising outside of wushu practice to build up that stamina. That was a great question. Um, any other questions or comments? We're just talking here. We got another 10 minutes, we can cut it off, we can keep talking. Really, I just wanted this to be a, a chance to have a conversation and for people to be able to ask questions. You know, I'm kind of interested to hear, you know, of the content that we went through today. I'm interested to hear from mm. everyone. What is, what, what from that are you like, yeah, that's what I do. Or was just like totally new to you. You know what I mean? Like in general of the, of the whole day's sessions. Yeah. 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 We can talk about just Wushu Day live in general. 
what, what, what else did you see? I only saw uh, Martinez Chen Tai Chi session, which I thought was great. And then I just saw the end of uh, the Pigua. What did you guys well, watch? I, I was talking more about like the stuff that you had covered. Cause you know, I think oh. um, some of the stuff is like, I think we all kind of know it, but maybe we've never had someone put it so eloquently that we can understand <laughs> that. So, you know what I mean? so one of the videos I wanted to show, but uh, it's, it's on a quick time and I've got a weird setup here. You're not gonna hear the audio is the interviews I did with Brian Wang. I think some of you have watched it. If you haven't, I have this YouTube channel, jio.com. Um, so Brian Wang, uh, great competitor uh, from the United States, but he's been doing Wushu for a long time. And when you have a conversation with Brian and you can see it in these interviews I did, you can tell that this guy's really thought about Wushu in general and also thought about his Wushu. And um, I enjoy that interview so much because it's like you're seeing the inner workings of like how he got to where he is. Again, it's going back to like, if you just see somebody and try to copy them, you don't know the path they took to get there. You don't know, you know, what stages, what steps they took to get there. You're just going to copy. Whereas Brian is talking about, yeah, I, you know, I listen to Wushu. I watch Wushu and, and listen to what it sounds like, how the feet hit the ground. I listen to my Wushu. You know, I, I feel my chest opening and closing. I go to practice this week and I do it one way. Then I go to practice next week and I do it another way. I think a lot of Wushu athletes, because we're, you know, amateurs and we're just doing it for fun. It's like, we go to Wushu class, we follow Sifu, we listen, and then we're like, okay, class over, bye Sifu, and then we leave, we go home, and your brain is just like off until like, oh, Tuesday at 7.30, okay, go to Wushu. And that's fun if you're doing something just as an activity, right? I, I love Wushu and Tai Chi as an activity because it like, gets me out of the house, gets me away from work. I get to go to this place, not during the pandemic, but you know, I have this special place, and I leave all my thoughts behind, and I go in and go to, do Wushu. If you're just doing it as an activity, totally cool. But if you're serious about getting good at Wushu, you really have to start thinking critically. And like when your Sifu is giving you corrections during a class, you're like, yeah, head up, more feeling. Okay, I, I don't know what he said there. Okay, this. And then on your way home, you should be thinking the three things Sifu said today was like, boom, 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 boom. Okay, well, what did he mean? And then on your way to class next time, okay, Last class, Sifu said this, this, and this. Okay, I'm going to work on this, this, and this. And then to be able to show up and practice and your Sifu, they will see. They'll be like, oh, yeah, palm, palm's better. Good job. Okay, not quite right, but, but I can see you're thinking about it. Wushu teachers love this kind of student. They love thinking students that are really trying to improve and not just there's a, there's a kind of student that shows up and they're like, okay, I'm just going to do it this way. And if, if it's wrong, Sifu will tell me. Oh, Sifu's not saying anything. I'm just going to keep doing it this way. And this is, you've all seen Wushu classes where it's like, these people are just like, why are they doing that thing? Because they're just waiting for Sifu to change them. What I like to tell Wushu students is like, there's two teachers in the room. There's your Sifu and you need to be the other teacher. You need to be the other person that's like reminding you there should be like an imaginary version of yourself or your shoulder be like, Brandon, remember last class, Sifu said to do this. Hey, don't forget, we're, we're going to be doing that combination coming up. Remember how you have problems on that hammer fist? Remember to try to work on that. You know, your Sifu is in this class. They're here, her attention is split between 20 people. They can't, you can't just wait for your Sifu to tell you what to do. You have to be reminding yourself as well. And once you leave that room, your Sifu is there. You need to be the other Sifu who's like, hey, remember to go home and stretch because, you know, you're having some problems in that move. Remember how, okay, do that drill a couple of times. Maybe just walk through it in your head. So yeah, are, go you know, be, be a thinking student, a thinking student. Go ahead. Yeah, go no, go for it. I, I, I want to make a comment, actually. I think uh, I really actually, also, among the other oh. things today, I really agree with what Brandon just said that, the two, there are two teachers in the room. There's your Sifu and then there's you. Um, I think I've really truly understood that or realized that not actually through like many years of Wushu, but when I started actually uh, going to dance class, which is our, my dance studio is literally two doors down from my martial arts uh, school in our Chinatown in, in, here in Houston. Um, because I mean, my dance class is not just, it's not just that, oh, it's a different activity. It's even their methods are different. So for one thing, you know, 
obviously the movements are nowhere near as physically intense or demanding as wushu but because of that we don't have like a water break like the entire class like the the one water break is at the end. <laughs> so we literally just keep on going and yeah. whatever song we're working on i mean it's a three minutes a song you know compare that to a wushu form in one minute 20 seconds yes it's uh, it's longer but it's not physically demanding but we're having to learn maybe one song in just one, uh, one month so we are literally you know uh learning a lot in every single class session and mm -hmm. so uh you know on top of that the teachers really i mean they can speak english but everyone else there is chinese so the mm -hmm. class is taught in chinese and i'm just keeping up you know knowing only english but it doesn't yeah. matter because i feel like I'm, I'm translating everything in my head because choreography is mm -hmm. a universal language i'm not there to learn chinese i'm there to learn body movement but at the same time mm -hmm. i'm telling myself hey wait you just did that wait yeah but what i just did didn't look like that okay what did i do differently yeah. than what she just did and eventually my brain mm -hmm. feels like an ai but then again ai is based off human learning in the first place so that's yeah. kind of weird to say that but then i eventually <laughs> i pick up on my own mistakes and i focus on my own mistakes and i stop thinking about okay uh oh i think that was good enough that was good enough no it's not good enough but and mm -hmm. well what brandon just said is true that when we go to our normal martial arts class we're just worried about just surviving getting through class and then saying bye and then we'll see you later because it was just so physically yeah. tiring and like, we, oh my god we got to do 100 kicks and you're like ah, yeah. 100 kicks yeah and we're so worried about whether yeah. or not we can physically do it we're not worried enough about already learning on how to do what we we're supposed to do properly not just like hey, yeah. can i physically survive am i flexible enough am i strong enough but yeah but sure. are you thinking about it enough mm. and i think dance is what got me to start thinking uh about mm. my movements enough so that way when i do see my teacher uh you know, do, do something, teach me a form or teach me a specific movement or combo, you know, even if he's speaking English before, sometimes I wouldn't fully understand it or fully understand how to best understand his teaching. So now I do, mm. now I'm actually following him in ways that are better. And he's actually been really proud that I, even though I had to go to dance to learn it, he's been a lot mm. more noticing that, dude, your dance is actually helping you to wish you somehow, like I'm sure. not going to explain things. It's not taking me as long to explain something to you now. Yeah. Like you know, again, this is going back to like, use other tools or methods, listen to different kind of music, try a different activity, you know, maybe take a little pause on Wushu and do a dance class for a little bit, or, you know, take some online classes for yoga. If, if you're having, you know, issues with stability or, or flexibility, try, you know, it's okay to take a little step away from Wushu, try something else. And then you come back and you might see it with fresh eyes and be like, oh, I liked how how in that dance class when the music stopped people didn't just go to the side and be like sipping their water they were like on the side and like you know trying to remember the step or imagine like if you went to a dance class and you had to learn this big choreography and if your brain just shut off when you left class and you showed up the next week and you'd be like oh, i forgot all the moves right you you have to stay engaged and i think with wushu um it's the same way you you have to be an active learner uh jun how are we doing on time are we okay here? We're at uh, two fifty-four. Um, really well, and the reason being, um, the next class is actually not going to be on Zoom. It's going to be on YouTube Live, and I'm about to send it. Oh, the that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we. Oh, okay. Like, Go for it. Okay. Okay. Um, there were a couple things in the chat, and I totally uh, forgot. Dusty said, "Really enjoyed experimenting, but have a hard time deciding on which version of each thing I want to do." Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Um. You know, try different things, record all of them. Give, you know, you gotta give each one a shot. You're not gonna be like, oh, I mastered that way the first time. Give, you know, try each way several classes, maybe even several weeks, several months, and then figure out like, well, which which one fits my body type the best or fits this particular form or this particular choreography or which one's gonna pay off the most in competition. You do have to try different things. It is iterative. Um, and hey, maybe when you get to a point where I'm like, I like doing it both ways, I feel like they're even, then that's when you bring in a trusted resource and be like, hey, I could use your opinion. I've been trying this these two different ways. I like both of them. Which one do you think is better and why? Okay. Uh, Ethan had another question. I had a question in regards to stretching. Everyone seems to have different methods. Pfft, yeah, dude, there's so many different kinds of methods of stretching. And what works personally not a fan don't think it's a good idea the monk style the force it i agree with you i think in some countries that works but i think um just not very scientific um more expanding with dynamic stretching yeah isometrically holding yeah yeah i think that's a better way of doing it i agree with you 
uh, wondering what my insight was on this because I don't have much knowledge. Okay, so stretching is one of those things like uh, stretching 20 years ago is different than today. And even if you follow like certain kinds of people like uh, Pavel Tsatsulin, who's a very famous Russian kettlebell and trainer, if you don't know who he is, you should know. I mean, he put out a book uh, decades ago, which when people disco discovered it, non-Russians discovered it, they were like, what? It like blew their mind. Like, what? There's this different way of stretching that isn't this other way. Um, but even if you follow Pavel, his methods have changed over the years, right? He's he, what he's recommending today is different than he what he recommended 10 years ago and different from what he recommended 20 years ago. And the cool thing about what he's doing or what people like him are doing is they're not just being like, well, it worked for her or it worked for me. You should do it. They're actually scientifically going in like, okay, we took these Russian gymnasts and we had them try this one thing. And then these other 10, we had them do this other way. And after three months, we found that their range of motion was better. Right, so if you if you can follow people that have a scientific process, I think you're going to find methods that um, have a higher probability of working for you. Right, it, like like I said before, we try to be a Chinese athlete because they've been doing it for six, since they're six years old. I start wushu at 18 years old. I can't use the same methods that a six year old did in China. Also, remember in China. Wushu, like with many sports, gymnastics, etc., it's kind of like a factory. They take like 100,000 kids and the 100,000 that uh, pass the first year or make it through the first year, they get to go on and that 100,000 gets whittled down to 5,000 that make it past their teenage years. And at the end, you've got like a, a, a few hundred that are elite athletes. That's not really scientific. It's just like the, the, the numbers game, right? Just throw them all to try to push them. And then they fall out. She breaks her leg. He busts his ACL. And then look, we've got 100 amazing Wushu athletes. So, you know, those, those methods work there, here, or in other countries, it does not work. So I would say um, read up on different books, see what people are talking about, and, and, and follow people who are doing like studies. And you can who can talk about oh this is the physiology of your body this is why it works don't just go on youtube and be like i did the splits in 30 days follow me yeah maybe for that person it worked for them that doesn't mean it's scientific like it worked for me it'll work for you it's not necessarily a good way of doing wushu um okay jun hong is putting that link into the next uh session that's um by uh chen jian feng right uh, from Fujian, now teaching Tai Chi and Wushu in Bend, Oregon. Great instructor. So I don't want to take up his time. I'll take maybe just any more last minute questions. Ethan, thank you for joining us. Keith says, advice you have for self-teaching. Oh, yeah. yeah, that is that is tough. That maybe is a question that's going to be saved for another day. Um, for all of you that are interested, you can follow me online. I do some Wushu live streams, probably like once a week where I'm just talking about Wushu. And, and some of the things we've talked talking about here just come out because I'm watching videos and making comments. So if you'd like to join those. But uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for supporting um, uh, Wushu Day Live. Um, I just wanted to say, if you want any Wushu gear, you can go to the Giles store and use Wushu Day Live 21 for 25% off. Boom. And a reminder, I got a Tai Chi class um, and Tai Chi sword class starting tomorrow. But cool. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I had a great time. And uh, see you in the next event. Bye. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Awesome. That was great. Um, I forgot to mention, you know, actually we're doing Wushu Day Live because of Brandon. Well, Brandon. He uh he hit me up and was like, hey, it's been a year. Are we doing this? <laughs> so I can't it's actually been a year. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and stream the next. Oh, I need to end this recording.